So good morning and welcome to today's roundtable, Engineering, Humanities and the Nexus. Uh, thank you very much for taking the time to connect with us this morning. Uh, it's a real honor and a pleasure to have our invited speaker, Julio Dino, uh, with us today. He is not only a top scholar in engineering the sciences, in, in the sciences, he's also an artist uh, and a man with a set of experiences that are very unique. Julio, I, I will introduce you more formally in just a moment, but I wanted to say thank you for taking the time to speak with us today. My name is Jeffrey Hurley Jimera. I'm a professor at the Universidad de Puerto Rico in Mayagüez, uh, and I'm going to be the MC, the facilitator uh, for today's talk. First, I want to recognize there's some people just from outside of the U UPR, and I wanted to say uh, welcome. Also, I also want to recognize that some people will not have access to the chat due to uh, just, just the nature of this platform, but I wanted to invite everyone during the question and answer period, uh, everyone is invited to, to contribute by opening your, your microphone. And so with that, I wanted to pass the microphone to Matias Cafaro, the Dean of Research and Creative Activities in the Faculty of Arts and Sciences here at the Universidad de Puerto Rico in Mayagüez for an opening message. <laughs> okay, uh, I just welcome <laughs> Julio Otino. Um, I'm just uh, here just to welcome you briefly. I don't know if we have to do this in Spanish or in English, so I just go ahead following your lead. I'm going to be doing that in English. But uh, I know Julio is from uh, my home country, so we're the same. <laughs> uh, so we can do this in English or in Spanish, it doesn't matter. But uh, you're welcome um, and to this particular, um, this particular uh, topic that we have been uh, very, um, very happy to put together, uh, thanks to Jeff here who has been uh, trying to come bring together humanities and engineering and STEM uh, sciences in general, uh, because we need to come up with new ideas and make progress with these interdisciplinary interactions and uh, the new programs that we are building and everything that has been progressing in, into the future has to look uh, something like we were discussing and coming uh, from the I'm a biologist so I'm coming from sciences in general but I do have a background in humanities so I understand the need to integrate both things and these conversations are essential for us to continue um, these efforts and so I'm really glad that we are having uh, these distinguished guests and having these conversations um, thanks to the technology that we have today. And it's really a pleasure to have, uh, have you here and briefly today to start this discussion. So thank you and thank you everybody for joining. And at UPRM, you're always welcome to um, have these kinds of interactions. So that's brief <laughs> as much as I can. Super. Thank you, Matias. So uh, thank you, Matias. So the way today's lecture has been set up involves our invited speaker, Julio Otino, and two respondents, uh, Ingrid Padilla and Hector Eike. Uh, and so I'd like for us to hold the questions and commentaries until the end. Uh, and I wanted to, to give a very short introduction to our speaker. I have, a, I have a formal bio statement for Julio that I'll read in just a moment, but I wanted to, to first just describe my own experiences with his work. Um, last year, we were in the midst of, of a curricular development period that resulted in significant changes in the role of the humanities in the College of Engineering. To be concise, while not completely eliminated, the, human, the humanities have been reduced uh, in the student experience in that part of our university. And so in that context, as department chair, I was, I was interested in looking for voices from engineers and scientists who have other approaches, whose ideas, on, whose ideas and intellectual experiences could dispute that model. Uh, that course is dedicated to literature and art and philosophy, uh, have a great deal of importance to, to the engineering as a practice and as a vocation, as a professional vocation. And I wanted to just describe what happened. I was, I was in the office in, in Chardon uh, and the phone was ringing, people were coming in and out, and kind of a steady flow of emails blinking on the screen. And I came across a, a lecture of his. And in this conversation, he talked about artists using visual language to ask questions and how these very skills are central to engineering as a practice. 
And Julio went on to, to challenge the overarching myth that the skills in the humanities are fundamentally different from STEM, from STEM skills, not only in terms of questions, but also the type of thinking that they encourage. And I wanted to thank you, Julio, for the commitment to the arts and to these types of this type of knowledge. Uh, and of course, also for your generosity for, for being here with us today. And I feel his experience in as much as being both an artist and a scientist, como una persona de Argentina viviendo en Estados Unidos, eso en sí me hace a mí como curiosar. Eh, igual, bueno, como tenemos nuestros colegas aquí, eh, Matías y Marcelo, en, entre otros, eh, gente que vive en, digamos, not just between nations, but between languages, between sets of academic rules, uh, and between sets of disciplines. And, and this spaces can be very fertile. Uh, and I think Julio's work really represents the potential of that. So uh, Julio, Julio Mario Otino is a researcher, engineering scientist, artist, author, and educator. Born in Argentina, he grew up with twin interests in physical science and visual arts, finding beauty in math and art and seeing creati creativity as being one thing rather than something living in compartments. Art provided a cathartic means of expression while growing up in turbulent times. He managed to mount a solo art exhibit while drafted as an officer in the Argentinian Navy. When he moved to the United States to pursue a doctorate, research achievements followed. Otino's research in nonlinear dynamics and chaos appeared on the covers of Nature, Science, Scientific American, the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences of the USA, and many other publications. He is recognized as the world leader in the field of mixing fluids and granular matter. Otino conclusively established the mathematical foundations of mixing of fluids with elegant groundbreaking experiments and pioneered understanding and modeling of granular mixing and segregation. In both fields, his groundbreaking work has led to the worldwide usage of his ideas in fields as diverse as geophysics, oceanography, microfluidics, and multiple branches of engineering and material science. He has written more than 260 papers, three books, supervised more than 67 PhD theses, and given invited presentations at over 200 universities in the US and around the world as well as at organizations such as Accenture, Boeing, Google, 3M, Unilever, and his book, The Kinetics, The Kinematics of Mixing, has been cited over 3,500 times. Dr. Otino has been recognized by numerous awards. In addition to his election to the National Academy of Engineering in 1997, the, National, the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, 2003, and the National Academy of Sciences, 2022, Otino has been selected as a Guggenheim Fellow in 2001, an American Physical Society Award Fellow, 1993. The American Physical Society also awarded him the Fluid, Fluid Dynamics Prize in 2008. Also in 2008, he was identified by the American Institute of Chemical Engineering as one of the 100 engineers of the modern era. He is currently the dean of the he's currently dean of the Robert McCormick School of Engineering and Applied Science at Northwestern, where he is also distinguished Robert McCormick Institute Professor and Walter Murphy Professor of Chemical and Biological Engineering. He previously held positions at the University of Massachusetts at Amherst, as well as chaired and senior appointments at Caltech, Stanford, University of Minnesota. He was also he was co-founder and first director of the Northwestern Wide Institute on Complex Systems, NICO. NICO links nearly all sectors of campus and has generated other centers in areas as diverse as systems biology, computational and social science, and engineering sustainability. Otino's leadership with cross-linking as the driving force has resulted in formal initiatives with every school at Northwestern, including business, medicine, law, communication, and journalism. His recent book, The Nexus, Augmented Thinking for a Complex World, The New Convergence of Art, Technology, and Science, with noted designer Bruce Mao, appeared in May, published by the MIT University Press. So uh, without further ado, uh, pass the de paso el microfono. Gracias, Jeffrey. So good morning and welcome to today's roundtable, Engineering, Humanities, and the Nexus. Uh, thank you very much for taking the time to connect with us this morning. Uh, it's a real honor and a pleasure to have our invited speaker, Julio Dino, uh, with us today. He is not only a top scholar in engineering and the sciences, in, in the sciences, he's also an artist uh, and a man with a set of experiences that are very unique. Julio, I, I will introduce you more formally in just a moment, but I wanted to say thank you for taking the time to speak with us today. My name is Jeffrey Hurley Jimera. I'm a professor at the Universidad de Puerto Rico in Mayagüez, uh, and I'm going to be the MC, the facilitator uh, for today's talk. 
first, I want to recognize there's some people here from outside of the UPR, and I wanted to say uh, welcome. Also, I also want to recognize that some people will not have access to the chat due to uh, just, just the nature of this platform, but I wanted to invite everyone during the question answer period, uh, everyone is invited to, to contribute by opening your, your microphone. And so with that, I wanted to pass the microphone to Matias Cafaro, the Dean of Research and Creative Activities in the Faculty of Arts and Sciences here at the Universidad de Puerto Rico in Mayagüez for an opening message. <laughs> okay, uh, I just welcome <laughs> Julio Otino. Um, I'm just uh, here just to welcome you briefly. I don't know if we had to do this in Spanish or in English, so I just go ahead following your lead. I'm going to be doing that in English. But uh, I know Julio is from uh, my home country, so we're the same. <laughs> uh, so we can do this in English or in Spanish, it doesn't matter. But uh, you're welcome um, and to this particular, um, this particular uh, topic that we have been uh, very, um, very happy to put together, uh, thanks to Jeff here who has been uh, trying to come bring together humanities and engineering and STEM uh, sciences in general, uh, because we need to come up with new ideas and make progress with these interdisciplinary interactions and uh, the new programs that we are building and everything that has been progressing in, into the future has to look uh, something like we were discussing and coming uh, from the I'm a biologist so I'm coming from sciences in general but I do have a background in humanities so I understand the need to integrate both things and these conversations are essential for us to continue um, these efforts and so I'm really glad that we are having uh, these distinguished guests and having these conversations um, thanks to the technology that we have today. And it's really a pleasure to have, uh, have you here and briefly today to start this discussion. So thank you and thank you everybody for joining. And at UPRM, you're always welcome to um, have these kinds of interactions. So that's brief <laughs> as much as I can. Super. Thank you, Matias. So, uh, thank you, Matias. So, the way today's lecture has been set up involves our invited speaker, Julio Otino, and two respondents, uh, Ingrid Padilla and Hector Eike. Uh, and so, I'd like for us to hold the questions and commentaries until the end. Uh, and I wanted to, to give a very short introduction to our speaker. I have, a, I have a formal bio statement for Julio that I'll read in just a moment, but I wanted to, to first just describe my own experiences with his work. Uh, last year, we were in the midst of, of a curricular development period that resulted in significant changes in the role of the humanities in the College of Engineering. To be concise, while not completely eliminated, the, human, the humanities have been reduced uh, in the student experience in that part of our university. And so in that context, as department chair, I was, I was interested in looking for voices from engineers and scientists who have other approaches, whose ideas, on, whose ideas and intellectual experiences could dispute that model. Uh, that course is dedicated to literature and art and philosophy, uh, have a great deal of importance to, to the engineering as a practice and as a vocation, as a professional vocation. And I wanted to just describe what happened. I was, I was in the office in, in Chardon, uh, and the phone was ringing, people were coming in and out, and kind of a steady flow of emails blinking on the screen, and I came across a, a lecture of his. And in this conversation, he talked about artists using visual language to ask questions, and how these very skills are central to engineering as a practice. And Julio went on to, to challenge the overarching myth that the skills in the humanities are fundamentally different from STEM, from STEM skills, not only in terms of questions, but also the type of thinking that they encourage. And I wanted to thank you, Julio, for the commitment to the arts and to these types of, this type of knowledge. Uh, and of course, also for your generosity for, for being here with us today. And I feel his experience in as much as being both an artist and a scientist, como una persona de Argentina viviendo en Estados Unidos, eso en sí me hace a mí como curiosar. Eh, Igual, bueno, como tenemos nuestros colegas aquí, eh, Matías y Marcelo, en, entre otros, eh, gente que vive en, digamos, not just between nations, but between languages, between sets of academic rules, uh, and between sets of disciplines. And, and this 
spaces can be very fertile. Uh, and I think Julio's work really represents the potential of that. So uh, Julio, Julio Mario Otino is a researcher, engineering scientist, artist, author, and educator. Born in Argentina, he grew up with twin interests in physical science and visual arts, finding beauty in math and art and seeing creativity as being one thing rather than something living in compartments. Art provided a cathartic means of expression while growing up in turbulent times. He managed to mount a solo art exhibit while drafted as an officer in the Argentinian Navy. When he moved to the United States to pursue a doctorate, research achievements followed. Otino's research in nonlinear dynamics and chaos appeared on the covers of Nature, Science, Scientific American, the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences of the USA, and many other publications. He is recognized as the world leader in the field of mixing fluids and granular matter. Otino conclusively established the mathematical foundations of mixing of fluids with elegant groundbreaking experiments and pioneered understanding and modeling of granular mixing and segregation. In both fields, his groundbreaking work has led to the worldwide usage of his ideas in fields as diverse as geophysics, oceanography, microfluidics, and multiple branches of engineering and material science. He has written more than 260 papers, three books, supervised more than 67 PhD theses, and given invited presentations at over 200 universities in the US and around the world, as well as at organizations such as Accenture, Boeing, Google, 3M, Unilever, and his book, The Kinetics, the Kinematics of Mixing, has been cited over 3,500 times. Dr. Odino has been recognized by numerous awards. In addition to his election to the National Academy of Engineering in 1997, the, National, the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, 2003, and the National Academy of Sciences, 2022, Odino has been selected as a Guggenheim Fellow in 2001, an American Physical Society Award Fellow, 1993. The American Physical Society also awarded him the Fluid, Fluid Dynamics Prize in 2008. Also in 2008, he was identified by the American Institute of Chemical Engineering as one of the 100 engineers of the modern era. He is currently the dean of the he's currently dean of the Robert McCormick School of Engineering and Applied Science at Northwestern, where he is also distinguished Robert McCormick Institute Professor and Walter Murphy Professor of Chemical and Biological Engineering. He previously held positions at the University of Massachusetts at Amherst, as well as chaired and senior appointments at Caltech, Stanford, and the University of Minnesota. He was also he was co-founder and first director of the Northwestern Wide Institute on Complex Systems, NICO. NICO links nearly all sectors of campus and has generated other centers in areas as diverse as systems biology, computational and social science, and engineering sustainability. Otino's leadership with cross-linking as the driving force has resulted in formal initiative. In my conversation with Jeffrey, I volunteered to give a talk. I love to talk about things like this with people who are interested. And I was not thinking of something very formal, but very much I appreciate the, the chance to give this talk to all of you. Uh, thank you to Matthias and in advance to Hector and Ingrid for the possibility of explaining the things. Yes, I wrote this book called The Nexus, and the book is about two issues, leadership and innovation. And the book is unusual because it has a subtitle and an upper title, but the two issues that the book covers are augmentation of thinking and complexity. So I'm using the book as a point of departure, but the the theme of what I want to be able to talk today is engineering, humanities, and the nexus. Uh, almost everything that I'm going to say has the, a root in the book. I mean, after all, this was my chance to explain everything to everybody. But the content of the talk today will be explaining why it's important to think about these connections, the thinking modes. I will give a brief, brief detour on complexity, and then lessons that cross domains, art, technology, and science. And then the picture of what we do here. So my point is to kind of explain my thinking and explain what we do. And if there are things that are of value to you, you are welcome to grab them. Uh, I want to discuss some of the implications of these ideas. Now, I'm in a situation in which, as a dean, I can implement some of the ideas. Uh, so 
the situation may be different in other places. Let's see, start with the why, okay? Universities produce two things, ideas and people. You have a system of recruiting people, money coming from many sources, and the goal of the university is to produce better people and produce ideas and impact. And the question that you can ask is, what's the system to produce this? And, and why is this an important question now? It's important because we can go and list problems that we are facing, and the list will be very, very long. Uh, technology permeating all areas of society, the concept of work is being redefined, bigger plans require bigger teams, and so on and so on. Blur boundaries are blurring, the knowledge is being fragmented, knowledge and power are being distributed. The, the, the list is enormous, and I don't want to go through all of this. Uh, waves of innovation becoming shorter. Uh, wealth has never been greater, but the divides between richest and the poorest have been increasing. Environment is changing. In fact, connectivity is changing all the rules. And in fact, from this list, and you can make your own list and it can be longer than this, you can uh, isolate some things that are relevant and permeating lots of spaces, including technology penetrating what is called digital humanities, could be analysis of text. And we actually invested on this in Northwestern. There was a professor from English. We gave an appointment in computer science. And there's no question that some of these ideas have technology has affected some aspects of humanities. Um, I wrote not long ago a piece in Forbes asking about making the point of we need Renaissance scientists. And a fellow from Stanford, pre tenure, wrote an article with the title Iphigenia and the iPhone. He got tenure since, very gutsy of him, and basically argued that some of the thinking skills that are fostered in humanities are very relevant to innovation. For this piece, he was savagely attacked. But the point is, not everybody has to agree on this, but it's clear that there are different thinking modes that we can characterize different disciplines, OK? So let me kind of explain that uh, using technology first. So many of you may have seen a graph like this. This is the evolution of any technology. It's a birth, rapid growth, and maturation. And you can pick any technology. And here I'm picking technology of uh, storing knowledge or co uh, communicating knowledge, starting from writing, which was a technology itself. And if I show you these pictures, and even if you come from outer space and you ask me questions, you will probably conclude that this typewriter came after pens, and this old Macintosh came after the fountain pen. So there is an arrow in technology of direction of progress. Uh, now we're in the cloud with many of the things, and even the modes of storing knowledge, the papyrus, paper of different kinds, cloud. And in technology, sometimes you see the changes with your very eyes. So for example, these two motorcycles are a little bit north of where I am now at the Milwaukee Harley Davidson Museum. And the model of 1912 Harley Davidson has one cylinder and a leather belt. In 1913, they evolved quickly to two cylinders and a chain belt. So, you can see that things kind of move in one direction there. And all the knowledge is stored in building combustion engine motorcycles will not help you when Harley Davidson has to transition to e-bikes. Okay. So this is a few comments about the thinking in technology. Now I'm using in the book 
and I will use it in here, visual art. And why visual art? Because in visual art, the trail survives, at least within the production of an artist. So before Picasso produced Guernica, which is now at the Reina Sofia in Madrid, he was at the MoMA in New York for many years, he produced 43 sketches, two of which are here. And you can see how the idea didn't suddenly appear out of thin air, how there was an evolution in there in the life a production of Picasso. Now, if I show you this collection of pictures, which are in the book between 1910 and 1988, um, unless you have been trained in modern and contemporary art, it will be hard for you to put them in the right chronological order. Uh, this Kandinsky is the oldest, this Basquiat is the newest, but if I ask further which two pictures have been produced by the same artist, uh, that would be hard to answer for people who really have not really been immersed into this field. The, the two produced by the same are Richter here and this one, those two are the same. Even in things that have more technology, like chairs, every designer and architect has had the compulsion of designing a chair. And there is more technology in chairs in terms of materials as opposed to paintings before. Um, it would be again hard to put them in a chronological order. The, the point of designing a new chair is that your chair cannot look like any other previous chair. So in technology, things evolve this way and one technology doesn't it, it wait for the other one to disappear before trying to replace it. And eventually they come kind of a, a series of connected revolutions, which leads to this picture. And then I have this picture in which their evolution of what seems like technology is evolution of uh, some kind of thinking. But what I contend is science, the progress is methodical. There are not dead branches in the evolution of science. It's, if there is a dead branch, that's eliminated. In technology, there's one revolution after another one. And in art, especially now, well, let me use the words of Peter Skeldal, who was the art critic of the New Yorker, he said, the modern, postmodern, and postmodern must be in the last recognizable periods in art. Then those movements, too, disintegrated, and it has been pretty much one dumb thing after another one ever since. And I agree with this. So the, the, this picture captures the, the thinking modes in science building on over the past. Science is, by definition, open source. You have to cite your sources. Technology is continual adaptations with disruptions, and art is now constant reinvention. So if I have to put this in some sentences, in science, standing on the shoulders of giants is a good strategy. In technology, the only reason to stand on the shoulders of a giant is to crush the elder giant. And in art, it's a bad idea to stand next to anybody. Derivative is not a bad word in technology. Adaptations are good, but in art is a bad idea. Okay, so we have these two modes of thinking. The brain is much more complex than this, but just to put it in two categories, we have what I will call left brain rational skills, which are logic, analytical, convergent, uh, sort of proceed in terms of the map. Uh, the intuitive right brain being creative, metaphorical, divergent, more in terms of images. Uh, decomposing problems on one side, putting parts together on the other one. So these are different, ways of seeing the world. This is what we'll call, if you could put the two together, is um, nexus thinking. So they are thinking modes. And a question that I'm not going to try to give it even my thinking of what I mean by humanities, but the question is, what does humanistic thinking bring to the table? And the usual response from many people is, we bring critical thinking. I think that to explain this is kind of explaining the obvious because it will be kind of similar to say, what does scientific bring, uh, thinking bring or stem? And we bring scientific thinking. So I, I don't think that there's even a need to explain 
what kind of thinking you bring to the table. Uh, there is much more in here. And uh, for example, in the book, I, I argue that in science, one of the objectives is to make the unrecognizable recognizable. The, the things that are unfamiliar, making them familiar. Uh, uh, finding the root cause of many things in a simple picture. And art, especially modern art now, is seeing things in a different light and is making something that you may have seen like a million times in a different light becoming unfamiliar. Uh, I get into discussions about perplexion, uh, the critical engagement with art, but it's a, it's a clearly completely different mode of thinking and having the possibility of using completely different parts of the brain that look at things in different ways. Clearly, if we could manage to use both sides, uh, the augmented thinking will lead to a richer set of possible ideas. Now, the problem is that uh, this augmented thinking may require dealing with views that are in conflict with each other, okay? But the point is, we want to have the best possible thinking skills to look at the complex problems facing the world. So what is an education? I would argue that we work really, really hard to equip ourselves with a mental library that will give us a lens through which to see the world, okay? And this library, unless you keep working on it, can stagnate. And then you encounter people who are not very able to incorporate new ideas into their thinking. And the glasses that they have equip them to see only a fraction of what is in front of them and not all the possibilities. So, the ability of thinking in terms of reconciling viewpoints, this idea uh, came from uh, quantum mechanics and is the idea that is still, this is more than 100 years old, is the idea that one thing can be two things at the same time. And this duality started with Niels Bohr and explaining light, that can be light, and, uh, can be a wave and can be a particle depending on how the questions you ask and how they intersect with matter or traveling through, uh, traveling through. So the idea of something be two things at the same time, let me kind of explain here a teeny bit, teeny bit on complexity and the difference between complicated and complex. A complicated system, everything that you see on the left, the nuclear sub, the jet, the clock, is a system that was designed by, with a blueprint, every part of that design fulfills a function. There are instructions for assemble, assembly. There is even a user manual to diagnose failures and repairs. The things on the right are complex. A, a brain is a collection of neurons. And a school of fish, obviously there is a collection of fish, but you can study a fish to death and never be able to explain how fish organize in schools. In the same way that you can study a neuron to death and you will not be close to explaining consciousness. consciousness. So in a complex systems, they are robust, they fail gracefully, they tolerate imperfect components, they are adaptable. Uh, for example, a classical example, uh, of adaptable weak ecologies. They are contextual. The parts can fulfill different functions depending on context, for example, stem cells. And the important thing of complex systems is that you go from this, let's say fish, neurons, to this, and the organizing ability of complex systems is called emergence. So there are lots of lessons in complex systems that simple behaviors can produce complex outcomes, but the two that 
I want to single out in here is that chaos and order can coexist. And that organization can emerge without central control. So chaos and order, emergence and blueprint, they do not need to be either or propositions. Now, in trying to educate ourselves and trying to understand how other people think, it's important to think in terms of lessons that one area, one discipline, one domain can provide for others. So there are many lessons that cross domains. In here, I will mention something crossing from art. Uh, and why art now? Uh, I, I would say that art now, modern and contemporary art, is where artists are the most eager to establish connections with domains outside their domains. Uh, uh, this, I'm not going to go through this, it's a history of art in five bullet points, uh, but the ability for artists behaving more in entrepreneurial mode is something new and is something that did not exist before World War II, okay? So one lesson from art. Lithographs from Picasso. I will show a few, he did 11 of these, and we end up with this one that looks like nearly drafted bull. But if you look at the dates, you will discover that Picasso did it the other way around. This was the first, second, and this was the last. What's the lesson here? The lesson here is that you have to be able to go from complexity to simplicity. Let's we start with the bull, extracting the essence of the bull, or from simplicity, adding details and go to complexity. The important concept in here is being able to see simplicity in complexity and complexity in simplicity. And the ability at the ultimate level is be able to see both at the same time. Another lesson from art. These are sketches of Matisse for something that became La Dance, which is in the Hermitage in St. Petersburg. Uh, there is a second version of this at the MoMA. But Matisse, as great as an artist as he was, did not go to the studio and every day he had a masterpiece inside. Sometimes he painted something that was lying around in his studio. And there are examples of this. In here, this is a painting in which you see La Dance lying against the wall in his studio. And this is another one. So what's the lesson here? The lesson is Picasso, Picasso and also Matisse, they show up every day and painting. And sometimes they were great things that they did, but they did not want for inspiration to strike before doing something. Inspiration is overrated. You, if you want to produce something good, you have to be painted. La inspiración existe, pero tiene que encontrarte trabajando, Picasso dijo. Picasso, by the way, I, this is the next example. I think this is Picasso at 15, 17, maybe 22, 40. As you can see, even within an artist like Picasso, it's hard to see the evolution in a kind of rectilinear way. It's another example, Malevich, an early Malevich, another Malevich after that, and this. And you probably think that there is no way to go anywhere from here. And yes, there is. This was a late Malevich before the revolution came to Russia and everything became figurative art and Malevich had to retrace his steps. And the only signs, sign of defiance that he could find was to make a black square his signature. So what's the lesson in here? Start with a solid grounding, 
But if you want to do something new, learn the craft and then set it aside. Another one in here, this is close to me in the museum uh, in Chicago, the Art Institute of Chicago. This is Picasso. This is what is exhibited, but the original painting contained this that he cut. And why did he cut it? So the, the man on the left there was holding a fish that the baby was trying to touch because he looked at the end and what he had produced was not the initial idea that he had, per, uh, so he decided to cut it. There are very few examples like this, but the lesson in here is do not converge too quickly, step back and look at the entire picture. So all of this being said, and many of the things I tell undergrads the first week of classes, next week, in fact, I'm going to give a lecture to them, and many of these things will find a way to the lecture to people who just come fresh on high school. But their brains are very plastic. There's lots of malleability there. So one of the first things that they encounter, uh, in fact, is this course called Design Thinking and Communications. The course is unusual in the sense that the Wall Street came I think in 2006 or seven, um, probably, I don't remember exact date, and they spent two days with us. They interviewed lots of students and they wrote about two pages in, in, in the journal. And they produced this table. What is that the students learn when tackling problems without clear solutions? So the idea here is that you get put in a team of four, you are given a question, the question could be, the question always has a client. The client could be a mother and a child. And the child, let's say, was born without arms. He needs to be more independent. How do you help? So each team has to produce three proposals for the client at the, in the middle of the course in such a way that the client can say, you know, proposal A, we like it, but not this component. B, we appreciate the effort, but it's not for us, but we like this part about C. So in, in doing all of this, without really having had almost a single course of engineering except this, they learn all of these things, empathy, creativity, teamwork, brainstorming, humility, resilience. How is that we present this? So we have science, technology, and art, and we put science with discovery, technology with invention, and art with creation, although this is more debatable. And this part is the left brain side things, the rational, quantitative, and art and technology being, technology is always in the middle between science and art. Design kind of covers this spectrum, and engineering covers this spectrum. And what we do here is that with engineering design, we cover the whole thing. What's the point of what we are trying to do here, besides learning these skills that the Wall Street and there talk about in the course? What we are doing in here is a classical engineering program is you consume material and then you produce. You learn all the courses and then you have a capstone design or something. That's not how you learn writing or painting, for example. You learn to paint by painting. You learn to write by writing. You don't have courses, theory of writing one and theory of writing two, and then you start writing. Your consumption and production are intertwined. And then there are a whole bunch of courses that cross-link all education at Northwestern from undergrad to graduate students. And these courses are called novation. Uh, the one course is called Novation Medical. That is the only one that is the, the, the composition of the course is controlled. It's two students from engineering, two from medical school, two from the law school, and two from engineering. So the students, eight of them, they, they go to the hospital, they shadow a surgeon, and they have to produce an idea that represents an innovation in that space. Like that, there is a course on energy. 
So in these courses, you can find the students from anthropology, sociology, journalism, computer science, the business school, the law school, medicine is all intertwined. But you also want to help people make connections. There is a lot in the university, a lot to explore. They need to have the attitude that exploration is good. So let me give you one example. One of my colleagues in here, Anna Kuzmanich, is a professor of costume design in theater. He designed recently the, the costumes for uh, opera in the Metropolitan uh, Opera in New York, Eurydice, and wanted to have a dress that would convey the idea of Eurydice being uh, absorbed, captured by the darkness of the underworld. So she wanted to have a dress that became from white to black. So I connected her with people uh, in engineering and we discussed this, but I did not know that one of our students, this one in here, had actually connected with Anna, who is in here, for one of his projects. So we want lots of people like this student to go and find people and make connections. Engineer staff, but there is room to make these connections that will enrich your experience in Northwestern. We also allow for organic growth. What do students do when they can do whatever they want? So we created many years ago, in maybe 2007 or eight, Design for America. It was housed in Northwestern, went spread to 40 studios across the US, and eventually we outsourced this. Now it's part of the Watson Foundation, but continues having a chapter in here. And these are all students from all parts of campus picking projects, usually with a social context, uh, and it's not for credit. They do it because they like to do it. And so this answers the question of what do students do and they can do whatever they want? Well, maybe things like this, but you have to facilitate. it. So the whole brain network that we have is very rich. And just to end up with one more thing, we have invited people from other departments to give talks. In here you have uh, Larry Booth is an architect, Goldberg is, was the chair of philosophy, Jean Danning was an artist, and they had the conversations about the nature of creativity. I can show this uh, or send this, um, the links to these talks. Uh, Sandy Goldberg was philosophy, Simon Penny was an artist, this is a historian, Ken Older was a historian of science. Inigo Manglano Ovalle was a uh, MacArthur uh, Spanish, uh, Spanish artist. He's a, one of my colleagues in here. We have also artists at large. Dario Robleto is one that is uh, serving in, in that way. So the, the network here is at the basis, the entry point is the design thinking and communications, but then there are all of these courses that I mentioned, innovation, entrepreneurship on the side, the Center for Leadership is with us. So the design thinking and communication is the entry point. And as I said, it's about leveraging brain plasticity. But there's something more profound about the influence of this course, because at the very end, what people remember long ago after they have finished the course, is that what they learn in the course is leadership skills. So all of these things are leadership skills. If you want to be able to lead organizations, be within academia or in the in outside world, these are skills that mark you for life. So just to end up with sort of the manifesto from the book in here, today more urgently than ever, we need to augment our thinking and we need to acquire new ways of thinking, augmented ways of thinking, and we also need to master complexity. So what we are advocating in here, in everything that I do in Northwestern in the book, is the benefits of seamlessly traversing science, technology, art, and humanities in general. Just to end up with 
the library and the lens concept. We work really hard to build our mental libraries, and if we don't keep working hard, our library becomes stale. The glasses that we are equipped depend on the content of the library and is what gives a perspective to the outside world. We need to work really hard to train ourselves not to rush to find new ideas that may look disconnected from the ones that we have, leave room for unfilled books, and work really hard to augment your current pair. In a nutshell, what we are trying to produce is this. There are lots of problems in the world that look like this. Remember the scene simplicity in complexity and complexity in simplicity. Some people, when they see this, that's what they see. What we want are people who see this. So the future belongs to Nexus individuals and Nexus organizations. Thank you. Muchas gracias, Julio. Thank you so much. Uh, so we have uh, two respondents today. <clears throat> it's been really enlightening for, I have, I have my own comments as well. Uh, we have two, two respondents today. Initially, I had had Ingrid as uh, going first, but Hector has uh, a commitment coming up that was came up just this morning, and, and I wanted to see if we could slot him in uh, before Ingrid. So, uh, Hector, I'll, I'll pass the microphone to you. By the way, how much time do we have? I don't, right now have, we have I don't have anything after this for half an hour more, okay? An hour more, I'm free. So I'm Super. happy to Thank answer you. any questions as you want. Hector. Okay. Okay, um, muchas gracias, eh, Julio Mario Tino. Mm -hmm. um, excellent. Este, de hecho, a mí me gusta aplaudir. I, I like to <laughs> applaud after, after este, uh, presentations like this. Yeah, sí, um, si, quieres, si quieres hacer las preguntas en español, perfecto, ok. Lo que le dije a Jeffrey es que si doy la charla en español, me va a llevar... 20% más de tiempo. Este, sí. Cubrí más de 100 slides, pero respondiendo preguntas, español es perfecto. Bueno, I, I took notes in, in English and I think I've been, I, I thought through your process in English, so I'll try in English, but once in a while I might go into Spanish. Fine. Is that okay? Uh, absolutely, uh, yeah. Uh, Right. I'll, I'll be very brief. Um, I, I, first of all, I, I want to, to show that I, I want to tell you that I really appreciate um, the, the idea of bringing art into these kinds of discussions, uh, the idea of uh, the importance of imagination, the importance of creativity. Uh, I am halfway through, through, through the book. Uh, the Nexus, I, I received it in the mail uh, uh, last week. Uh, the importance of art uh, in, I think, in our university, we need to think about this, and we need it. We need to give it prominence. Mm -hmm. um, in fact, I've always had uh, some difficulties with the concept of STEM, uh, science, technology, engineering, and mathematics, because I think it it excludes extremely uh, important uh, processes that are inherent to science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. Uh -huh. um, uh, actually, when I look at our curriculum in engineering, uh, and I look at the program of art in humanities, what I find is uh, a, a radical separation that I don't think uh, should, be, should be there. Uh, there is very little, uh, I think we need a lot uh, we need to, to put a lot of attention to the nexus. I think it's a, it's a great concept uh, that, that, that we need to look at. But I want to ask a question uh, from my side of, of, uh, of the story in, in, in humanities. Technology for me, um, when I think of technology, technology is definitely value-laden. Uh, it's value-driven. 
-hmm. and, and in fact, the concept of progress is extremely problematic uh, for me uh, as a philosopher and as an ethics professor. Um, uh, take, for instance, take, for instance, social media. Mm -hmm. It is sold as a, a, a great aid in communication, as something that has exploded our possibilities of communication uh, across the world and that it has been fantastic. But actually, it's not, it's, it's definitely not that simple and probably you agree with me. Oh, completely, uh, completely, yeah. Okay. The, the, there, is, there, is, there is a lot more communication, but there is also a lot more polarization, uh -huh. a lot more isolation, a lot more fragmentation. The, the problems are complex in your use of the term uh, complexity. Yeah. Um, when I think of design, I cannot think of design uh, based merely on discover, which one tends to associate with science, invent, one tends to associate with, uh, with uh, technology, create, one tends to associate with, with art, because, because actually design is also something that has to take value or value yeah. in, into consideration. Yeah. Um, what, is the kind of, what, is the, what is the human being that we want in this world? What, is the, what should being human be? Uh, it's an extremely important question. It should be an extremely important question, for instance, in an engineering curriculum. Yeah. Um, and, uh, and I don't think um, uh, we are giving enough, enough emphasis uh, to that. In fact, in your presentation, uh, I, 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 I see you on thinking that progress is going on in a way that terms like constant disruption, uh, the, the, the constant disruptions that technology brings about, or, or terms like invention, uh, that, that, that there is progress as soon as there is constant disruption, or as soon as there is invention. I, don't, I think that one should go very slow. As you said at the end of your presentation, one should go slow there, uh, slower, because um, now I'm going to go into Spanish. Hay problemas ahí. Yeah, yeah. Eh, o sea, la, la, el, el, el progreso es mucho más problemático de lo que parece, especialmente cuando nos hacemos preguntas como ¿qué es lo que el ser humano debe ser? Yeah. ¿Qué debemos aspirar eh, para el ser humano? Yeah. Eh, yeah. La so, tecnología eh, no avanza eh, tan claramente. De hecho, oh, eh, comple eh, completamente. Eh, yeah. 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 Nos cuestionamos eso constantemente y con eso pues pues no, termino, esa es la pregunta que estoy, estoy totalmente de acuerdo con eso. Eh, en design, eh, a lot of design, and this is recent, is human-centered design. ¿Ok? Eh, placing humans at the center of considerations. And more recently, you don't solve climate change with human-centered design is life-centered design. So there are a couple of books coming, and I get a little bit into that in there. Regarding technology, it's really complicated, okay? Um, let's start with Socrates, who believed that writing was ruining communication, okay? Baudelaire called photography the enemy of art, okay? So it, it's even, is even the relationship between technology and art is not very clear. In fact, there are people still today, and I put a couple in my book, that take pictures without cameras. Uh, so it's, it's very, very complex. But the, the human-centered aspect of uh, that is the part that has evolved the most about design is, is what makes people think that not all things that could be done should be done, okay? But the, the way that you learn the things is by bringing people, as, as I mentioned in the, at the very end, bringing people from different backgrounds. Those talks were mostly for PhD students because uh, bringing uh, the chair of philosophy to give a talk about, uh, I don't remember the, what topic he used. Um, maybe it was a, talk about the value of constraints or something like that. No, you, you need 
you need to equip your brain listening to all of these things because it's very easy to fall into very simplistic thinking, okay? I mean, what we are seeing now with the consequences of the web and the internet is a classical example of unintended consequences. I mean, it's just, uh, I, I don't know if you make the, the list of what's good and what's bad, how do the list comes about, but there are so many negative consequences that no one ever envisioned. But I agree with that, yeah. I think the philosopher's intervention that you were recalling is, uh, was on disagreement, the importance oh, of disagreement. Dis import yeah, so I can, exactly. I, I can, I can send Jeffrey the talk. Uh, yeah. Sol Goldberg is a very good friend of mine. I, okay. I mean, the, the important thing, by the way, one thing that is important in here is how do these ideas appeal to students? Let me put it this way. When I started, we were accepting one third of applicants. Okay? These are the people who want to come to Northwestern. Uh, of a number that apply, we pick one third. Now, of the number that apply, we pick 6%. 6%. And the ideas appeal is a self selected group. You, you say who you are, these are. This is what we value. If you think you resonate with this, please come on in. There are enough number of young people who resonate with the ideas. Yeah, but thank, thank you for you. the comments, Hector. Yes, thank you so much, Hector. Siempre es un gusto pues colaborar con Hector, and and I think he's a person who has experiences and has questions that uh, destabilize a lot of the these certainties about technology and about art and about the, the relationships between the two. And I I kind of wish you guys would write a book together because I, that kind of thing would be would be really fascinating for me. Uh, so if we could now uh, take a moment and, and pasamos el micrófono a, a Ingvid. Bueno, buenos días, Julio. Buenos días. <laughs> I have to say, wow. <laughs> It's, uh, it's, it's been an incredible uh, talk, a lot of information, a lot of food for thoughts. Um, and I thank you for bringing all these ideas. Um, I have, I, 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 I'm trying to summarize a lot of this information in, 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 in my head. <laughs> it's a complex head, but we need to uh, take it to a simple head, right? <laughs> or vice versa. Um, and, I, and I'm going to say three things, probably two comments, and then I have a, a, a question for you. First of all, I, I totally agree with everything that has been said in this talk. It, it's, uh, it, it is so true. Um, the other thing that I wanted to mention was, you know, at the beginning, you, you uh, indicated university produces two things, ideas, and and people and you know the resources that you put in and so on and i would and i would say there's the universities also and you know scientists and engineers and artists within universities um also produce solutions to to people right so not just ideas that stay but, out there in the no, you know no, <laughs> but, but ideas ideas i mean intellectual property innovation maybe spinning out companies, all of that I call it under ideas. Papers, yeah. books, concepts, uh, all, all of that is under ideas, yeah. It, it, and it, yes, and, and, um, but one thing related to this talk, it's this, the solution part in our society really needs to talk to a large percentage of our population that do not necessarily think like scientists and engineers. Uh -huh. And the use of art, humanities, communication, to be able to talk to uh, and, and, and take the message to that population of stakeholders that do not, that should start getting engaged, just like we 
scientists and engineers should get engaged in the art. Um, but using the art as a as a media to really to reach people that ultimately make decisions and um, and implement solutions and you know and and use what we're creating those ideas. It's extremely important, and 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 I think the arts have a huge role to play in that. Um, and ultimately, what we do in science and engineering, if it doesn't improve the well-being of the people, then you know it's yeah. just staying there, right? So how do we how do we take it to what we're trying to help? The other the other comment. So I so I think there's a great interaction in there. Um, the other comment I wanted to make was on this part. You said inspiration is overrated, uh, and perhaps. I wasn't sure whether this inspiration is overrated, and then you know, start with the selling ground and um, and and stay back and look at the big picture. It was mostly referring to the art, but I do think that similar things are necessary in the science and engineering. Oh, absolutely, right? The, I mean, the, 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 the lessons were intended to be. I mean, the truth is, scientists, most scientists, do not understand that how much process and discipline there is in art. They tend to equate art with inspiration, moments of epiphanies. And by the same token, artists equate scientists with cold, dispassionate thinking, leaving a, out emotion out of the picture, is, is trying, to understand, trying to understand how both sides think. Uh, we equate a lot of our thinking to the outcomes that these domains have produced, but not with the thinking that went behind them. If we understand more the thinking that went behind, understanding the process, we will be able to communicate much better. That was the point. So the lessons in there were intended to be absorbed by science and technology, but they come from art. And vice versa. I have another one coming from science and art that should be absorbed by artists. Yeah. And, and definitely, I mean, inspiration for scientists and engineers, it's it's also right. It, it's like you think like you have the solution right away, and and you don't. I mean, it it, it in, I think it applies exactly the same way. Have, this have, you know, these have. comments to scientists and engineers, whether we want to um think about that that way. Yeah, yeah. Um and then the other and and this is probably going to be the question and and probably the complex question <laughs> or simple i'm not sure um you also started your your talk and by the way it would be great if if it could be shared with with the participants i, I would love to to be able to to digest this talk a lot um in a finer in, in a finer um granule um it's um you you said you know you're you're a dean now and it allows being a dean allows you to implement uh some of the changes that perhaps need to occur to kind of bring these things together that naturally many many years ago were not really brought together or were not really assessed together i can i i will explain that a little bit more yeah and and, and when you do explain it would be great because I, we do believe, and I, as as Matthias uh, indicated, that we have to move in that direction. Mm -hmm. um, and but the, the logistics of doing this, you know, at at the institutional level, you know, requires you know that creativity that we need from the arts, that thinking that we need, you know, step back and look at it. But so that logistics of really bringing it together and talks are great, but but there has to be some energy put into the programmatic curricula, you know, how do you build it? So my question is, how do we start? So as a dean, and I'm an unusual dean, okay, because um, as Jeffrey said, I have produced 66 PhDs. Uh, now my group is 11 PhDs, so I have lots of research going on. But one of the audiences that I communicate a lot with is people in Silicon Valley, okay? And the people in Silicon Valley, 
and I want resources from them. I tell them that I play two roles that normally in Silicon Valley will be sitting at opposite sides of the table. On one hand, I'm, I'm an academic entrepreneur. I, I can see collections of people and ideas that if they were brought together, they will produce something really good. Uh, that was the idea behind creating lots of centers, university-wide centers. They go beyond engineering, okay? Uh, so I am an academic entrepreneur, but I'm also a venture capitalist, okay? A venture capitalist is the person who has the resources to invest in an idea and see if the idea flourishes, okay? The ideas that I can invest, they don't have to be mine. I, 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 in fact, I would argue that a definition of a leader is someone who provides conditions for successful emergence. You want, you want people to come with ideas and you want to add the money coming from your hat as VC and you see this as an entrepreneurial venture, but obviously, I don't have to convince other people to do the idea. I can do things. I'm the team. Okay. Uh, in in some instances, I may go to the provost, but I can do many many things. So that's a, a tremendous advantage. Okay, tremendous tremendous advantage. Regarding the other part that you mentioned, the how do you communicate? Um, I think it's becoming better now. People are becoming better in science communicating with the outside public. But still, many scientists distrust media. In fact, Michael Crichton, who was the fellow who wrote Jurassic Park, uh, after, I think, the movie or the book, he was attacked by many people in science for inaccuracies in the book. And he gave a talk at the American Association for the Advancement of Scientists, Science. And he said, scientists complain that media does not understand them. But the opposite is also true. It is scientists who not understand media. So still there is a stigma for people who are very good communicating ideas. Once, once you have the check marks of being all in the right academies, you can get away with things. I can I can do anything I want, really, and no one will. But God forbid that you try to do it too early. Okay, Carl Sagan. Remember him, the one of Cosmos, very good. Community. There was a scandal. He was about to be elected to the National Academy of Scientists, this uh, science, and uh, the thing did not go, did not come to pass because people complained because he, he, they equated the ability to communicate with being not intellectually deep. Many people com, confuse obscure with profound, okay? <laughs> As opposed to being clear and not being lightweight. Uh, so, but still we need to work a lot in educating students and faculty on how to communicate ideas to the media. People are becoming much, much, much better than they were just 15 years ago. I, in fact, I'll give you one change. I don't know if this has reached you uh, in Puerto Rico, but 25 years ago, if you were coming up for tenure, let's say in the chemistry department, and you had patents, you probably will not mention that. Patents were seen as a distraction. Now, patents are seen as an asset. Uh, in fact, in our definition of tenure in here, besides research, teaching, service, the two things that we have put is leadership and entrepreneurship. They have to be really way above the bar. But the definition of what constitutes being a successful academic is also changing. Thank you so much. No, my pleasure. It's uh, it's It's been a wonderful, wonderful um talk and a lot of information. Yeah. Jeffrey, 
you could take it back. I don't know if he's there. Well, oh yeah, he's coming online. But while he comes back, I have to say that I could see why you know you're you are able to mix um, fluid dynamics and and um, mixing in arts and so on, right? Because uh, there's a lot of um, they, there is no question that a lot of lights. <laughs> visual imagination has helped me a lot in in science, a, a lot. Um, but. I had to battle that because uh, there were very few images. In fact, I grew up when color images were appearing in journals. And um, people thought that that was not needed, that, um, that somehow all of this visual part was superfluous. Uh, instead of being able to communicate the ideas more clearly, they, I mean, I, there is a fellow here, Francis Stoddart, a colleague of mine, he won the Nobel Prize of Chemistry. And my point of connection with Fraser Stoddart, he's a Scottish guy, is he was one of the first guys who put color in molecules in papers. And he had to battle editors for the need of adding color that will help. Now you open nature science, you see color everywhere, but that was not easy, the required education. Okay, so I don't know if Jeff is yeah. Yeah, I'm back. I just had a, it's, it's a, I had a glitch in it, so I was, went out and came back in. Uh, thank you guys so much. I have some comments that I'd like to share. I also have a question, but before I do that, I wanted to if we have uh, students or anyone else, because I feel like I've, I've spoken a lot, uh, who have a, a, a comment or a remark at this time. Okay, well, well if not, I, what I wanted to say was, first of all, thank you so much, Julio. I feel like this is really wonderful. And I wanted to, to bring attention to Ingrid's comment and in, in one comment from Hector and also uh, one of the comments that you made. Ingrid, who says, using art to make decisions, this is a, a really a wonderful idea. And Hector, who talked about the radical separation that we have on our campus and using the nexus as a kind of mode or a solution to, to these, what I, what I understand myself as, as a problem. And, and to kind of relay that into your experience, Julio, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about how your experience as an artist influences your, your life as a scientist and as an engineer and, and as an academic and as a dean. Oh boy. Um in many ways. Uh, first of all, it allowed me to have conversations with people in the Art Institute. Uh, we teach courses together with them. Uh, people, people within my own institution in, in, uh, who are in art theory and practice, the department. But the, I think one of the the things that people uh, outside science believe the most is that all science operates under the umbrella of the scientific method, okay? And fine, I grant you that that may apply to aspects of biology and a whole bunch of things. Really doesn't apply to any theoretical work. Theoretical work is not First of all, it's not deduction, it's induction. Uh, it clearly does not apply to anything that comes to math. Uh, but somehow the, the thinking processes that go on deciding what to do, uh, if you are in more theoretical aspects of science and how artists think about what they want to do, which in theory is they can do whatever they want. Um, I, I see some connection in there that allows this understanding on how others think. That has helped me a lot in my career, both in what I do in research, but also in my ability to communicate with people who are in different camps and kind of bringing them together. I mean, it's, but 
I understand that not, not everybody will agree with you. So for example, I, I have worked and written some things with people in humanities in here, but if I go randomly and pick someone from there, I probably would be brush off. Uh, in the same way that if you are an artist and you want to communicate with someone in science, some people will be eager to talk to you because they are curious. I mean, th this curiosity is the only thing that is hard to teach. You cannot teach curiosity, okay? You have to foster it. Uh, but many people will just think it's a waste of time. In fact, I recently had a case of inviting someone, is talking with several people, and one of the people here thought, Oh, it will be a waste of time to talk to this person. We don't have much in common. Well, the point is you want to talk with people who do not have something in common with you. That, that's the enriching thing. If you want to talk with people who are very similar to you, that's easy. Excellent. 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 Yeah, we're, we're running a little bit short on time, but I have one other question that's, I think, I think very important that I'd like to ask. You know, here in, in Puerto Rico, uh, I mean, in my, my own kind of professional and personal experiences here, have shown me, I mean, after having lived in Spain and lived in the US and lived in South America, that, that students and faculty in Puerto Rico have very unique sensibilities, that the students and, and the context here endows people with certain abilities and skills that are very unique. Nevertheless, in those contexts, like you said, when there are you know so many applicants and just 6% are, are accepted and so on, that uh, despite that, despite what I what I would understand in my own experiences as being very unique and very valuable skills and and uh, and sensibilities, but in the uh, in the broader context, these are not generally recognized as skills. They are almost brought up sometimes as oddities, which I think is a real failure of the system itself as far as the way that evaluation kind of is occurs. But given that context, given the, the in the kind of the academy and in the, the professional world that we are in. What, is, what would be a strategy that our students could use, given the, the, the excellent skills that, that they develop here that they can't develop, they would not be able to develop elsewhere in order to kind of... I, I mean, what I, what I tell them way at the beginning, besides the fact that they will live in a world in which change will constantly rule their lives, okay, is two things. One is that the thing that they should extract from the education. There are the details, okay? And you are ruled by deadlines and a whole bunch of things. And you go into different branches of engineering, you have different requirements, mechanical, different than civil or environmental or computer science or whatever. What lasts and is useful is the timeless skills that come associated with, let's say, engineering. And that's the ability of thinking in terms of systems, relationships, uh, networks, quantitative thinking, the ability to, to put things on sometimes a rational basis. At, if you don't, but that's fine, okay? That allows you to solve problems. Uh, people want to hire because of that, but there is no big price for solving correctly what turns out to be the wrong question, okay? So you want them to have, this is the next level, the ability to ask the right questions. And then you have to have something above all of this. You have to have adaptability, okay? Adaptability and all the things, all the skills that we mentioned that they learn in the first week of class in year, the, the empathy, the, the ability to work in teams, to brainstorm, resilience. Resilience is so important, okay? So you have to tell them, yeah, you are learning specific things in here, but the broad picture is that there are things that are timeless, okay? Things, if you, if you equate engineering with the current technology, you are dead because that will go away, okay? Is the timeless skills what will help you? And after that, these higher level things like adaptability, resilience, 
uh, ability to communicate, all the things that are not really kind of at the center of the curriculum, but you extract in pieces. And some, some students are good in extracting the things, but you have to make it easy for them. And sometimes you have to design courses that will do that. For example, one thing that is very big for us is a component of courses that are called personal development. In personal development, we have courses like, because you are in a rat race, uh, there is a course called Designing Your Life. Um, the students in there are maybe a third engineering. The, the rest are from everyone on campus. But it's just to kind of step back a little bit, look at yourself as a system. You have to design your life, <laughs> the next steps. So there are several of these. Uh, we even have courses with uh, improv. Why improv? Well, Chicago is the, the birthplace of improv, but um, in improv, you learn two things. One is you are never the most important person in the group. And the second thing is always and, not or. You build on and. So those two things are super important. So there is a course on that. Super, super excellent. Well, we've, we've gone a little bit over time here, uh, but I wanted to thank you so much for, for coming and speaking with us today. I feel like, you know, Hector, Hector has your book right now and he's going to give it to me when he's done. But we, like I said, we, we met on, on Friday and we went through it, but uh, I'm looking forward to reading it de, de forma, digamos, cercana. Uh, so th thank you so much for, for coming and speaking with us today. Uh, Jeffrey, if, if I may interrupt, sorry. Yes. <laughs> There's a there's a question in the chat. I'm not sure if oh, you're okay. able to see it. I think it might have appeared when I was disconnected. Uh, let me see. Uh, otherwise, I could. It's from um. Paul. Yeah, there it is. Yes. You, yes. Okay. Thank you for bringing my attention to that. Let's see. What, so, uh, what is a good example from Picasso to the Boolean technology? I I I give you one example in science. Okay. The last, the very last sentence of the paper by Watson and Crick the one who unraveled the structure of the DNA. I mean, the, the beginning of the paper, and it's 900 words, the paper. So the beginning sentence is, we wish to suggest a possible, I mean, this is amazing. Wish to suggest two tentative things possible. It's three tentatives in there, okay? But the last sentence of the paper is, it has not escaped our attention that the structure so proposed can have interesting biological consequences. Well, all biotechnology <laughs> emerges from that. That's an amazing example of simple to complex, okay? Complex to simple, you can pick everything that Newton did. <laughs> uh, the universe was a mess and this person came and discovered that somehow everything could be organized in terms of a few laws. And from there, you march upwards. Now, this all this gets in the nature of reductionism and complexity again. But those two examples are, the DNA example is an amazing example of one idea giving birth to so many things. But you can put the discovery of a transistor being, or the invention of a transistor being in the same class. Super, excellent. Okay, fantastic. There is so much more to talk about this. Um, even with the question about ordering of things in time and progress, I mean, uh, that's so much more to talk about. Mm -hmm. Another topic that we didn't get a chance to is about language, but in, in on behalf of the humanities department and also the, the engineers who are uh, who are here, and, all, and also I wanted to just mention briefly that the support from the uh, from the chancellor's office. The chancellor wanted to be here, but he had a previous commitment. 